Press that hide thing. Is it okay now? Yeah, ma'am, just press that hide thing so that that pop up will go away. Okay. Right. So, mm. is it okay? Comfortable? Yes, yes. Right. So, I, I, uh, should, should I, should I start? Yes, is yes. So, fair enough. Shall I be able to see myself? Uh, you won't be able to see yourself. Uh, the only way you can see yourself is that you have to log in with another device and put the audio off of that device. No, no, it's okay. It's all we right. can see you clearly. Fine. Should we start, ma'am? Yes, yes. Bakul sir, should we start? Yes, yes, we should. Right, ma'am. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. And today is the first lecture in the hematology series, which is the evolving science of hematopathology yesterday, today and tomorrow. We have two very eminent hematologists here. I would like to introduce the moderator and moderator sir will introduce the speaker. So the, the moderator is Professor Dr. Ba Bakul Dalal sir. He is an MD, FRCPC, a DABP, an FACP, FASCP, presently is a clinical professor. UBC Faculty of Medicine, Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, Vancouver, Canada. I would request, sir, please, uh, would you introduce uh, Madam and we'll start from there. Hello, everyone. Good morning for me and good evening for you. I am delighted to introduce a very dear friend of mine, Professor Dr. Neelam Verma, MD, MNAMS. She is an ex-professor, recently retired as head of hematology at PGI Chandigarh. Dr. Dr. Verma hails from the mountains of Himalayas. She did her MBBS from Shimla and she did her MD from PGI Chandigarh, where she decided to settle and make a career out of it. She further trained in Australia and England, and then she settled down in Chandigarh to write papers and run the department. She has written over 350 papers and uh, given the written 23 chapters. Very prolific writer indeed. Her main interests are uh, in clonal hematopoietic disorders like leukemia, aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndromes, PNS, etc. And she has given uh, uh, multiple lectures in uh, all over the world including the Dr. Malti Sate oration in 2014. She is the past president of the Indian Society of Hematology and Blood Transfusion. She will talk today about her uh, lifetime as the experience of evolving science of hematopathology during her vast career yesterday, today, and she will look gaze into the crystal ball to tell her what tomorrow is bringing to us. Dr. Neelam Verma, please. Thank you, Dr. Bakul, for this uh endearing introduction. Uh, I wish to say that this presentation is not an exhaustive account of all the milestones in the evolution of hematology, hematopathology, and there are no relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. So the field of hematology has evolved so much, but apparently my computer and its connections haven't uh, kept pace, so very sorry for the delay. Uh, the discipline of hematology has given me so much. It has allowed me to learn from my mentors, from my peers, from my students, from my colleagues, and allowed me to travel the world and make friends, friends like Dr. Bakul Dalal. I am really blessed. I just want to uh, draw your attention to this picture. I, I wonder how many of you can identify this item. This is a source of light. It has a dia inside and it looks like a designer uh, antique item kind of a thing. But I remember uh, back in mountains where I come from uh, in uh, 1960s, I think we were using this kind of lanterns as source of light. Only difference was that instead of this metallic chimney, we were, our lanterns had those glass chimneys and it was an, really uh, some effort to keep them going and keep them clean. 
and uh, it seems uh, these are uh, coming at a good price these days. Those ones, earlier ones, used to be very cheap. And now we have these different sources of light and you have different shapes and sizes give you a lot of uh, illumination uh, when the sunlight is not around. So same way things have evolved in the field of hematology too. I, I don't know how many of the younger people are um, really aware of the Nuba chamber, the hemocytometer chamber, but I remember using these in uh, 80s and 90s also and uh, when the automation came, the hematology analyzer, the hemocytometer fell by the wayside. So that, that's what uh, life is all about. Things improve and you move on to the better things. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of USA, famously said, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. But today we are in for a lot of information about the past, the history, the evolving science of hematopathology. So I'll devote a lot of time on the yesterday part of it, a little bit of today. And as Dr. Buckle said, I would gaze into future, something about tomorrow, how things are likely to happen. And then in between, I'll talk a little bit about the Indian scenario and uh, give you some examples from the department, how things evolve. But uh, that would uh, be touching just few aspects of hematology because I know this lecture is going to be followed by specific lectures on different aspects of hematology. So we know that blood occupies a central part of the human psyche. It's been regarded essential for life and as a source of the life force itself. Every civilization possesses records which chart the human fascination with blood and bloodletting in terms of both ritual and medicine. The study of blood and hematology is regarded as a broad and evolving field of medicine and has fascinated physicians and scientists throughout the ages. There are some um, very eminent people, keen observers, uh, uh, with very uh, dedicated uh, approach to the uh, their field of interest, people like Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, William Hewson, Rudolf Schau. You'll uh, get to hear these names again in my presentation. So they really laid the foundation on which the entire discipline of hematology has been built. So if you ask me when did hematology as a speciality begin, the answer would be it was in the middle of the 19th century as it required the development of the microscope and good staining techniques. That's how we could see the cells. So because seeing is believing, that's a 17th century folk proverb. The hematology evolved differently in different countries, sometimes from internal medicine and sometimes from pathology. So I'll be mostly using hematology and hematopathology interchangeably, but I won't be uh, uh, talking too much about the therapeutic or the clinical hematology per se. So because the blood cells can be obtained so readily, you just do a simple venipuncture and you get the sample. So that's why hematology has been at the forefront of technological developments uh, throughout the centuries or since the venipuncture started. The diagnosis of malignant and benign hematological disorders has become more exact because of these technological advances and our understanding of the pathogenesis of many diseases has also improved. All technologies and tests need to be cautiously interpreted and a full history and physical examination should always be the first step in the investigation of patients and bare minimum in the hematological investigation would be a good blood count, complete blood count and uh, a very careful examination of the peripheral blood smear and the bone marrow smears or whatever material you have. Because blood is being examined by different, different disciplines, so hematology evolved over a period of time along with 
disciplines like clinical pathology, laboratory medicine, uh, blood banking, transfusion, nuclear medicine, oncology, medical genetics, developmental disorders, clinical chemistry, microbiology, and so on. So all these disciplines go hand in hand. So uh, the, um, the blood turned 70 years old in 2015, the blood journal. So this provided an opportunity to uh, Mr. or Dr. Barry S. Scholar to write a review about the extraordinary contributions of blood journal to medical science, medical diagnosis, treatment and prevention and the evolution of the discipline of hematology. The brainchild of the hard driving and visionary medical book publisher Henry M. Stratton and the eminence grace Dr. William Damship. Uh, the blood journal became the first English language hematology periodical and the publication began, began in January 1st, 1946. So that was a landmark. The American Society of Hematology was created 11 years later. Mr. Stratton also initiated the informal blood club at the 1954 Atlantic City meet, meeting of the Association of American Physicians, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, and the American Federation for Clinical Research. He also brought together 10 hematologists at the 1956 meeting of the International Society of Hematology in Boston that led to the creation of ASH at its organizational meeting, which was led by uh, Dr. Damchik uh, on April 7, 1957 at the Harvard Club in Boston. The first official ASH meeting was held in Atlantic City on April 26, 27, the year 1958. So interesting thing is that uh, Dr. Wintrobe set up the International Society of Hematology in 1946 and the American Society of Hematology in 1958. But he initially opposed the setting up of hematology as a separate speciality, believing it should remain under the umbrella of internal medicine. He, however, appears to have changed his mind when he was elected president of the International Society of Hematology and later president of ASH in 1971. So those things also happened. So what happened in France, hematology as a speciality began in France in 1931, followed by Italy in 1935, Germany in 1937, and Netherlands in 1953. The French Society of Hematology was the first in the world to start in 1931 by Paul Chevalier and Jean Bernard was the general secretary for, can you believe it, for almost 40 years. So you get a position of eminence and you hold on to it, it happens. Unlike in Britain and the United States, there was no opposition to the establishment of a French hematology society. In UK, the society representing British hematologists came rather late to the scene. British hematologists had traditionally presented papers at other societies like association of clinical pathologists, the Association of Physicians, and the Pathological Society. Formation of National Society for Hematology was opposed by many in Britain. They shared the same concerns as Dr. Ventrovic. The British Society for Hematology was formed in 1960-61. Now, British Society of Hematology is the single most important voice of the speciality in UK. It has been very successful financially and has one of the leading journals, the British Journal of Hematology and website BloodMed, which are very popular. In Germany, the German National Society of Hematology was founded in 1937. And then the transfusion medicine, hemostasis, thrombosis, they were original, originally all considered part of hematology. But later the blood transfusion separated and then Later, still later, the thrombosis and hemostasis part also separated. Then in 1977, the society became the Dutch, the German Society for Rheumatology and Medical Oncology and so on. In Russia, the uh, uh, Dr. Alexander A. Maximov, uh, he was a Russian-born morphologist. 
uh, working in Chicago and in 1924 he used extensive histological findings to identify a singular type of precursor cell within mesenchyme that develops into different types of blood cells so called mesenchymal stem cells so which was a landmark discovery and the uh, other colleagues expanded on this uh, finding uh, and then uh, the first clinical trials of mesenchymal stem cells were completed in 1995 15 patients were injected with cultured mesenchymal stem cells to test the safety of the treatment and then various clinical trials were being conducted to evaluate the efficacy of mesenchymal stem cells in treatment of gvhd following the allogeneic stem cell transplantation hematology in russia developed as an interest in the treatment of hematological malignancies but later became intimately involved with transfusion medicine because of the needs of the world wars the international society of uh, on thrombosis and hemostasis uh the uh, the international committee on thrombosis and hemostasis was formed in 1954 and the international society on thrombosis and hemostasis uh, came into being in 1969 and it has uh, expanded its areas of interest to platelet function regulation mechanisms of thrombosis fibrinolysis thrombolysis problem of thrombotic disorders and so on then international society of blood transfusion also was formed and the impetus was given by two major fields or areas the world wars and the infectious diseases uh, although the casualties were massive in world war 1 it was not until the spanish civil war that modern blood transfusion came of age so that's how the need for blood collection improvement in the blood collection typing and transfusion was felt and lot of advancements happened into it uh, and with the advent of hiv aids also this became an issue and the screening for the various viruses became mandatory in europe the european association of hematology was founded in brussels belgium in june 1992 Uh, EIA has close ties to the European School of Hematology and the ASH, and engages in education both within Europe and many other countries through through its excellent outreach programs. The birth of uh, EIA, however, was not without its difficulties. The uh, EIA currently holds an annual congress in the month of June, and the journal is Hematologica. so uh, this again i have taken from the review article from blood and it gives you the uh, various milestones in the history of hematology before 1946 and you just marvel at the uh, capacity of fine uh, observation of these uh, stalwarts and the sense of dedication and the keenness to work uh, with minimum um uh, facilities at their disposal so there you have the discovery of close circulation by uh, harve uh, you have uh, dutch biologist jan swammer dam who discovered rbcs using a primitive microscope just simple lenses were used and they could magnify the uh, uh, items uh, many times up to 200 times and they uh, made such fantastic discoveries description of not really rbcs but i think these were insects and sperms and uh, small plants by anthony von devenhoek in uh, 1670 the discovery of wbcs fibrinogen and so on in 1770 to 74 came the uh, transfusion of human blood to a patient in 1818 the description of hodgkin disease the first successful whole blood transfusion to treat hemophilia by lane the hemocytometer uh, development uh, happened in uh, the year 1852 to 76 and this was the effort of uh, many investigators 
the discovery of the role of bone marrow in hematopoiesis by Newman and independently by Bezos Zero. In 1868, Warshaw described leukemia, thrombosis, and embolisms, and uh, everyone in hematology pathology is aware of the Warshaw's triad in thrombosis. The blood cell counting developed by Ehrlich, uh, sorry, blood cell staining developed by Ehrlich. So that was something fantastic that you could see these cells, which happened in 1878. And this was followed by his identification of three types of granulocytes: mast cells, polychromatophilia, and megaloblast. The first description of phagocytosis by Macnikoff in 1882. First, the role of platelets in hemostasis and thrombosis in 1888. The discovery of the blood groups by Lance Steiner in 1901. Then description of polycythemia vera by Osler in 1903. Description of paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, the bleeding time assay, and effectiveness of platelet transfusion. The sickle cell disease, the identification of those sickle-shaped RBCs. First description came in 1910. Use of citrate as uh, anticoagulant. The description of Glanzmann thrombocytemia, thrombocytemia by Glanzmann. The description of infectious mononucleosis. Description of Feldkamp syndrome. Description of thalassemia by Cooley and Lee. The uh, Van uh, Van Willebrand uh, disease. Uh, the classic report of liver as first effective treatment of pernicious anemia by Mino and Murphy. Then first description of Fanconi syndrome. These are such rare diseases, but the these the, these uh, uh, eminent scientists had the keen eye to detect these rare things. Also, the description of Fanconi syndrome happened in 1927. Hematocrit technique refined by Ventrove in 1929. Sternal puncture to obtain bone marrow, and uh, we do the bone marrow examination as a routine. Most of the people do it in hematology practice. The identification of role of intrinsic factor in 1929. Bintrobe described the classification of anemia based on the RBC indices in 1934, and we are still making use of this information. The uh, development of acidification assay for PNH happened in 1937, and it's such a intelligent test uh, really remarkable the anti hemophilic uh, factor was identified in 1937 effect of warfarin on pt in humans described in 1941 macroglobulinemia described in 1944 anti human globulin test to identify incomplete antibodies developed by coombs so coombs test in 1945 and we still Cannot get away from this test. We still have to use these in the relevant scenario. Efficacy of nitrogen mustard compounds in lymphomas and all. The electronic blood cell counting came on board uh, in 1953, and after this, the advancements in uh, blood cell counting, the CBC analyzers haven't stopped. Really, it's going on and on. The Journal of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine was founded in 1963. Although at that time the laboratory medicine was uh, didn't exist as an independent uh, discipline in 1963, it was just a stepchild of uh, clinical chemistry discipline. All the advancement, the automation was happening in clinical chemistry, and the laboratory medicine they were doing uh, the manual. Uh, Techniques. They were employing the manual techniques. So uh, yes. So what is the role of technology? What has happened in hematology? We uh, you saw some of this history. So I am a great fan of history of uh, science, history of hematology, especially. I hope the all of you in the audience uh, share my interest. 
and uh, can uh, really relate to uh, these uh, landmark discoveries. So in hematology over the years, the, the most re remarkable things happened, the discovery uh, of or, or uh, development of microscopes and the staining methods so that you could see these uh, cells. Uh, the fluorescence microscope, the epifluorescence and confocal microscopes, then automated cell counting, the flow cytometry, automated digital cell morphology is just coming on board, the uh, development of fish probes, but most remarkable thing that has happened in 20th century is the molecular uh, biology techniques, the PCR and its varied uh, extension and modification that has really changed the scenario. This uh, provides you the table uh, of uh, papers published in blood between 2006 and 2015. And uh, I just wanted you to uh, notice that the contribution from India uh, is just 0.1%, which is something we need to ponder on. So then we move on to the Indian scenario, what is happening. Uh, and what has happened uh, over the years in India. But before that, uh, uh, I'll just uh, uh, share these few points that uh, Dr. Ghosh has uh, so uh, beautifully written in the review article published in 2011. The progress in any scientific field, including hematopathology, is possible only when a country is ready for one. So are we ready for that? Number two, good work in hematology is generated or in science is generated from a handful of centers in any country. These centers are usually directed by leading workers and pioneers in the subject. Subsequently, the able disciples trained in that center spread out elsewhere in the country, expanding the list of research. The fruits of good work finally reach the common people either via industry institute cooperation or as in case of the medical research, institutes may themselves develop new advanced facilities to help common man. So Indian Society of Hematology is about uh, 62 years old now and it has uh, split out from the uh, uh, Indian uh, um, uh, Association of Physicians of India uh, Society as happened in the ASH also. So pioneers in the field of hematology in India did some exemplary work. They also developed center of excellence and human resources for future of hematology work in India. But we realized that they worked under extremely difficult and trying circumstances on our subject, not widely appreciated as an independent subject with limited funding from uh, Indian Council of Medical Research that was available earlier on. Now we have some other uh, uh, sources of funding uh, available as well, uh, uh, like DVT and DST and so on. So the pioneers uh, were working, uh, Professor J.B. Chatterjee, Dr. Das Gupta in Kolkata, uh, pioneers working in Mumbai, working in CMC Valor, and uh, at the Bombay Blood Group Reference Center under the ages of ICMR. Uh, so all they were uh, trying to spearhead the uh, advancement of hematology in India. National Institute of Nutrition did some pioneering work on iron metabolism and continues to produce useful work in the same area. So before 1980s, because the um, reagents were not freely available, automation wasn't there, so the uh, emphasis was on um, studying the prevalence of common hematological disorders, interactions of nutrition deficiency, and hemoglobinopathies, malaria, kalazar, microfilaria, and other parasite-related topics. These uh, common things which were there uh, in our country. The establishment of assays for polycastin and vitamin B12 uh, was required to study these deficiencies in Indian population. The time-consuming and technically demanding microbiological assays had to be established in some of the centers, School of Tropical Medicine, AIMS, PJMER, PARC, CMC, Valor, National Institute of Nutrition are few such centers where such assays were available. 
so uh, in our uh, department also uh, these essays were available and the organism the lactobacillus gracii uh, and the grana gracilis uh, we were uh, maintaining those cultures and i think in 1992 or somewhere like that the cultures died down and later on we shifted to the automated essays now the original work on vitamin b12 and folate deficiency for almost a decade originated from the department of rheumatology at our institute under the uh, able leadership of professor kesi das he also showed contribution of folate coenzymes in the transport of vitamin b12 across the cell membrane he devised a detailed deoxyiridine suppression test deo suppression test to dissect mixed b12 and folate deficiencies in a test tube and unmasking of b12 and folate deficiency that by chemical levels in the presence of severe iron deficiency another important classic observation was that lymphocytes remember past folate b12 deficiency long after these deficiencies were corrected so i think some of these tests were being done when uh, friends like dr bakul dalal and others were uh, working uh, in in the department or some of them must have left also to uh, greener pastures this is how the test was being done i think i won't go into the details i'll just move on to the next part of uh, hematology evolution in indian scenario that uh in um, around 1980s the myelodysplastic syndromes were being uh, described in detail classification of acute leukemia by fab criteria uh, uh, has been proposed so uh, different people different workers were working on these areas immune dysfunction caused by iron deficiency anemia b12 folate biochemistry binding proteins of vitamin b12 in different hematological disorders evaluation of microchromatography for measurements of uh, hba2 compared to visual inspection elution and measurement of hba2 from electrophoresis strips <clears throat> that was the usual uh, methodologies being employed the cytochemistry in leukemias myelotrophic biopsies in hematological disorders these were the main areas of research in various institutes as i mentioned the reagents were not readily available very little work on blood coagulation was done one or two centers in the whole country were involved in basic coagulation work with the um, home uh, made reagents the first case of anti thrombin 3 deficiency was reported from the country by dr mohanty in our department uh, she also adapted the technique for detecting anti platelet antibodies and uh, much more work was also done by um, Uh, her and other colleagues of hers and dr kesi das uh, i i think because of shortage of time i won't go into all those details so after 1980s the work in the area of thrombosis and hemostasis started getting published significantly more allogeneic and autologous marrow transplantation data started emerging from few centers the interest in work in the area of hemoglobinopathies nutrition anemia as expected slowly dwindled HIV infection arrived in our country and transfusion transmitted viral diseases became an important issue so in uh, in the meanwhile uh, young doctors also started showing interest uh, in hematology and the transfusion medicine uh but we must realize that most of the indian medical colleges or institutes do not have a separate department of diagnostic hematology or hematopathology uh hematopathology and transfusion medicine mostly function under the uh, umbrella of department of pathology only two institutes offer hematopathology super specialty courses that is dm hematopathology that is pgi uh, mer uh, chandigarh and aims uh, new delhi many other institutes offer clinical hematology super specialty courses the dm clinical hematology to candidates having md degree in internal medicine pathology and pediatrics this picture was taken in december 2012 during the pgi alumni meet and this shows you the pathology alumni group 
just strain your eyes and try to identify the luminaries in the field of hematology. Professor Casey Das, late Professor Casey Das. Dr. Deepika Mahanti, she is there in the audience. Uh, Professor Gurjeevan Garewal. And then you have a host of uh, others, uh, my uh, respected teachers, colleagues, and many, many students, many of whom have uh, become leading, leading figures in hematology and pathology and other allied specialities. So always nice to look at this picture. So I'll just come to a few examples how, which will show you that how much, what different we are doing in different diseases over the years. This um, short paper was published in American Journal of Hematology 2000. And uh, here we, I think, compared the conventional test for PNH, the uh, Hams and sucralysis test, and we performed uh, flow cytometry also using monoclonal antibodies CD55 and CD59, which I got as gifts because these were not commercially available that time. And uh, later on, we moved on to using uh, the commercially available uh, reagents, the flare, the anti-CD24, anti-CD15, monocytes uh, were being tested, or the, all these other all cell types using flare and so on according to the proposed guidelines. And uh, so with great sensitivity, we could detect the PNH clones. And uh, this uh, paper showed that the presence of PNH clones does not completely exclude an inherited bone marrow failure syndrome even in children. Although there was an earlier publication in uh, 2014, European Journal of Hematology, where Dizan et al. reported that detection of PNH clones helps to exclude inherited bone marrow failure syndromes. We beg to differ. So the usual diagnostic workup of PNH uh, entails preliminary tests, the screening tests, the specific tests for PNH diagnosis based on the complement sensitivity and its causes. So ham sucralysis test I mentioned, then we have gel cards and then flow cytometry for GPI and proteins, the flare assays. Uh, now we don't follow this routine that we don't do the preliminary test, screening test, we just go on to perform flow cytometry for GPI anchor protein and the flare assay uh, uh, for, for uh, classical PNH cases or for detection of PNH defect and bone marrow failure syndromes in the setting of thrombosis and so on. And uh, if we find a defect and uh, patient is suspected to have uh, classical PNH or bone marrow failure syndrome, then we go on to perform these other tests, the ham sucralysis test. I think there have been almost years when we haven't done this uh, ham sucralysis test, although it's nice to get them done and show to the students. So I think I'll just skip these, the, the way we used to do HAMS test and the sucralysis test. It would take almost whole day for the technician to perform these tests. Whereas flow cytometry gives you just perfect results. Then just to show you the granulocytes, which are showing 85.7% uh, efficient population. The granulocytes here, uh, showing 92.3% efficient uh, uh, population, monocytes showing 91.2% PNH population, the RBC is also showing uh, a significant 53.4 and 22.5% uh, PNH population and this patient had overall clinical presentation and the uh, flow uh, results also support or confirm a diagnosis of classical PNH. Then what is happening in uh, CML? Uh, we know about these many first in the history of CML, in the history of hematology. So it has to be diagnosed in the appropriate clinical setting. You look at the peripheral smear, these beautifully stained, the whole range of myeloid cell populations. Uh, and then earlier we used to do 
so many things, the um, LAP scoring and whatnot, and uh, great emphasis on hypercellular bone marrow with granulocytic and granulocytic microkeratocytic hyperplasia. Now we can detect the Philadelphia chromosome, and many of you uh, might remember that uh, uh, earlier uh, the photographs of the banded metaphases were taken. Uh, then the technician, Mr. Uh, Krishan Lal and Kiran Malik and so on, they would cut out these individual chromosomes and then line up, uh, line them up and uh, have a karyogram ready for you for reporting. Now the same job is done by our karyotyping station and with uh, much, much greater accuracy and sensitivity. Now, we, uh, in, in addition to the cytogenetics analysis, we uh, perform the automated RQPCR using the gene expert system also for our CML patients uh, for the monitoring purposes. We perform the um, RT-PCR also to identify various uh, VCR able transcripts also. So this was the publication, uh, our experience published in uh, 2015 about early molecular response in CML where we had used the gene expert uh, uh, in these patients. This uh, slide shows you a paper written by Dina, Jasmina and Manuk Desh about the hematological practice in India. Uh, just the important message is that hematological practice ranges from availability of advanced diagnostic facilities and treatment to uh, unavailability of basic medical services to rural, rural India. Problems include a very, very huge population the socio-economic disparity, minimal coverage of health insurance schemes, and the uh, government's inability to provide universal health coverage, and uh, the recent experience with uh, COVID-19 has really brought out the deficiency in our, in our health uh, coverage, um, the coverage of the health uh, care in our country. Uh, this uh, is a student of uh, Reena, Manu Jambal, who has uh, done a PhD thesis on the unexplained, uncharacterized uh, hemolytic anemias also. This just shows you the uh, usage of uh, NGS to identify nonsense variant in the hexokinase 1 gene causing severe non-spherocytic hemolytic anemia. Uh, so in the case of childhood uh, B cell precursor ALR, we are supposed to do the morphology, we are supposed to do the flow cytometry and then after identifying BCT ALL, we have to perform the cytogenetics, fish, RT-PCR in these patients and if possible DNA index also. So this is just example of translocation 411 and uh, this shows you the RT-PCR, the multiplex RT-PCR result for VLL fusion transcripts and uh, the ETB6, RANX1 fusion, the probes can tell you about the fusion of these two genes high hyperdiploidy uh, or um, uh, the uh, intrachromosomal amplification of uh, chromosome 21, I am 21. So very informative uh, probes there. And uh, Shri Jesh has spearheaded this work and I think it just got accepted or, or, or just got published. I think just the page numbers are not there. This is about the frequency, hematological characteristics and end of induction residual disease in B acute lymphoblastic leukemia with BCR able one like cameric gene fusion in a high risk cohort from India. Uh, so we are doing almost everything that can be uh, done for these patients and as a part of PhD thesis, uh, Dikshit 
So I have just finished his work on identifying VCR able like uh, gene signature using machine learning uh, based uh, nomogram. So how has uh, the science of hematopathology evolved? You had those, the hemocytometer earlier and then some of the earlier hematology analyzer and then you can have most advanced uh, CBC analyzers available these days uh, which can give you so many diagnostic parameters and some research parameters which can be validated to be used as uh, diagnostic parameters. So something like uh, monocyte distribution width in the setting of sepsis, we have just uh, uh, analyzed this parameter in our emergency department patients. Uh, can uh, peripheral blood film be analyzed uh, digitally? Yes, these uh, different platforms are available. The Cellavision, the Sysmex, the I60, the Vision Hema. So, if possible, if available, they can be used. And uh, this group where uh, Gina Zini is also one of the authors, they say that the morphological assessment of the blood smear has been performed by conventional manual microscopy for many decades. Recently, rapid progress in digital imaging and information technology has led to the development of automated methods of digital morphological analysis of blood smear. In order to realize the full potential of digital morphology hematology analyzers, pre-analytical, analytic and post-analytic parameters should be standardized. Manufacturers of new instruments should focus on improving the accuracy of cell pre-classifications and the automated recognition and classification of pathological cell types. With all current devices, a skilled morphologist remains essential for cell reclassification and diagnostic interpretation of the blood smear. So this is quite a um, uh, intelligent uh, use of the technology, but uh, I think we are yet to uh, use it uh, in full flow. Then uh, this paper was published in Acta Hematologica 2019, Morphological and Immunophenotypic Clues to the WHO Categories of Acute Myeloid Leukemia. If you look at the molecular classification of acute myeloid leukemia, we just shudder to think how many of them you can really diagnose. But if you do this morphology and immunophenotypic uh, help, you take help of morphological and immunophenotypic clues, uh, you can certainly diagnose acute promyelocytic leukemia, most of them with a high degree of certainty. Provisional identification of cases associated with translocation 821, inversion 16, translocation 122, and NPM1 mutation may also be possible. And so is the case with transient abnormal myelopoiesis of Diamond syndrome. How I wish that this statement, these clues are available for other categories of AMLs also. So the other advances in flow instrumentation. Uh, there are these are new kits on the blog: the image flow cytometry and mass cytometry, the single cell sequencing, which is going to come up in a big way, I think, in near future. And there are many applications which can be there, but I think uh, assessment of response to therapy, vaccine development, cell cataloging, and uh, cell atlasing making atlases of cells. These are some of the uses. And then if you look at the top of the list, biomarker discovery, rare cell type discovery, which is very much feasible with the single gen uh, cell genomics. There are many, many other applications also. So evolving science of hematology tomorrow will be that there is increasing participation of basic biological scientists and scientists from various physical sciences and information technology to solve some of the vaccine problems of some of the hematological disorders. So in near future, I think NGS will become a commonplace technology. Uh, it will uh, become much easier to apply and uh, should become more cost effective, I guess. And then other newer molecular technologies also should be easily applicable. 
and with the use of these technologies the disorders with germline predisposition i think their incidence is going to go up right now i think we are missing many of those so there is a monoclonal antibody boom there is availability of better and better molecular tools there is explosion of knowledge on the wonders of genetics and molecular biology so the question is should hematologists put the microscopes on ebay the question is asked by mars went weir and toston have a lack so what is your answer my answer is no for the time being we still need the microscopes so many of the government medical institutes have not done well as well as expected due to poor funding lack of incenting and lack of a road map for developing and retaining human resources in our country so the sub there is a need for substantial inputs to improve health infrastructure and encourage real science not pseudo science thank you then only we will have more uh, developments in the field of science including hematopathology thank you very much for your patient hearing thank you very much uh, dr verma for Uh, an informative a very interesting and exhaustive journey through the hematopathology and clinical hematology and we are uh, indeed uh, delighted to learn that hematology in india is now growing by leaps and bounds and there are more centers for doing dm in both clinical hematology and hematopathology when i was in i was in india in the 70s there was only md in medicine there was not even md in hematology and now you have dm in hematology and hematopathology so uh, we have really done uh, reasonably well in the field of hematology the subject is now open for discussion anyone any comments we requesting people to unmute their mic and you know speak bakul bhai the yes deepak yeah nahi hello hello very nice talk ma'am uh, you went through the past present put your video on as well sir the video video deepak yes sir I, i'll just put my video on yeah. yes good to see you <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you i was just in another meeting by uh, professor peginda he was giving a talk right right he just reached to the side uh, what i am saying that uh, the technology is moving at such a rapid pace for a under resourced country like us it is very difficult to keep pace with that yes so uh, today you buy something and in another couple of months that gadget becomes obsolete and something else comes up today we have next sec tomorrow you have high sec then you have some other sec so there is no end to acquiring this gadget so i think we have to make a judicious uh, mix of technology and uh, our own uh, madam had said microscope will still remain the bread and butter but i think keep pace with the international technology we have to have something minimum to do uh, basic diagnostics and and there will be certain sectors of excellent like data memorial and nih uh, the national institute of clinical so like that uh, and cmc the lower even we are doing business as well so i think there are will be some centers who will be Uh, helping people to do such high end thing but i think most of the indian sectors to at least be able to do basic hematology work for yes hematology with close cytometry should be good enough to diagnose the acute leukemia and if you want to do cytogenetic or molecular genetics that you need to outsource rather than try to invest more of the fees developing these couple of we have to develop a system of referral as to where you can send your sample for these advances 
yes i would uh, agree totally with you deepak and i think uh, uh, in a resource constrained country like ours we need to identify different areas different fields of interest for different centers i think all the centers need not do everything right so yes. some centers can have uh, expertise in a uh, different uh, set of diseases other centers can develop expertise in different set of diseases i think that's how we can optimize our resources and produce good work these days without molecular biology uh, analysis it's very difficult to publish things publish paper so we need to work on that well, what do you think dr bakul we should we do yeah, I, think, I i think i think in the era of uh, resource resource poorness we have to rationalize the uh, funding and uh, develop a system whereby different large institutions will focus on different aspects of uh, newer technology and uh, the referral system can be developed uh, by whereby uh, everyone can benefit uh, for and and say still keep up to date in a large country as in, such as india it is very difficult to uh, to do everything by everybody and uh, uh, centers like tmc and pgi and aims should take leadership and develop a consortium where the advanced investigations which are very expensive and very rapidly evolving can be uh, can be diversified yes and we definitely need more funding in the healthcare system has the definite need for more funding and yes. i strongly ad, ad, uh, advocate for the medical council of india and the department of health ministry of health to give, give more funding to uh, for the better betterment of the patients better treatment even though uh, dr deepak said that uh, morphology and flow cytometry is enough for leukemias uh, with the, the newer targeted treatments the the molecular studies are becoming uh, of uh, important and uh, uh, and and mandatory for for the proper treatment and for that you need to do, you need more resources yes for prognostication and uh, direct treatment sure right okay any other comments questions nobody has has anybody typed no no ma'am there are no typed comments right okay 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 nadim i think i can't expect many questions in the history <laughs> history part of hematology it's just like story telling i guess the seniors are here they should be you know putting in there i was expecting dr mohanty to say something is she is she still she is she is logged off yes yes okay okay right well if there are no more questions then thank you very much dr verma for a uh, very lucid presentation and uh, look forward to seeing more from you Thank you thank you very much for being there and uh, thank you Nadeem for inviting me to deliver the talk I think I on the screen virtually he he looks like uh, uh, the admiral of the fleet Who oh, sorry I said Bakul bhai is looking like admiral of yes, the fleet Yes 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 <laughs> <laughs> He's dressed yeah. up like a moderator <laughs> distinguished mm-hmm. moderator yes yeah yeah good to see you all yeah good to see you all thank you very yes. much thank you thank you, thank you so much ma'am thank you for consenting and thank you uh, thank dr bakul uh, to consent to be here as a moderator thank you dr deepak and everybody else who joined in this is a very important lecture you know uh, and this will be there in the youtube and there's a recorded version for everybody to go back and see the yester years of hematology that is something which we all are not a very much aware of thank you so much ma'am thank you bye bye take care ma'am good night thank you thank you bye bye